model-based approach for testing the mobile device. Right. Take away first. Thank you. That's almost a little too dark, no? We eventually we'll get this right. Right. Um, so um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as James uh, said, I'm a PhD student at One Uni, and uh, we work. Um, on uh, more of the software engineering side, uh, we work with testing and especially with model-based testing. And as uh, happens on every, uh, or to every PhD candidate, someday uh, the supervisor comes and says, okay, I have an idea that we can apply what you are doing to something related or something else. And Actually, my uh, work is on model-based testing. Uh, but my supervisor came and said, OK, um, I was thinking that we can apply that to um, operating systems, to kernels or to modules in operating systems. Um, I would say generally model-based testing is a technique, it's a black box technique uh, that is very good for high-level um, for you to define a high level um, specification of your requirements in a kind of formal way, uh, but still it's high level. And as far as I know, most of the development in kernels and operating systems is very low level. So they said, okay, we have a problem there. But then we started to uh, see what we can do for uh, applying this approach to the testing of operating systems. And we come to these uh, conclusions. Um, it's already, it, this is an ongoing project because there is somebody else at Unity that is taking over that to uh, make it, uh, to, to apply this approach um, to a whole range of uh, uh, modules in a kernel or in an operating system and see what uh, we can achieve. Um, well, as I said, um, the model-based testing is a black box testing approach that focuses on functionalities, not on the code. Okay? Um, although, we can say that every piece of code is a model. It's just a low-level model, but it is a model. So we can talk about models in different levels of abstraction, and the same concepts will still apply. Uh, but being a, used as a black box uh, approach, we, is, we discover that we don't need or we do not require the knowledge of the internals of the kernels to test them. Okay? We can test them from a system perspective where um, we, we pick one module, one function, and we say, okay, the, the role of this function is doing x and y and z things. And then we apply that function and then we assert or we try to see if uh, that goal was achieved by the function. And we saw that uh, the testing on some of the modules, for example, we, we went to the, uh, the storage community and then we saw that there are some tests uh, available on the internet, the test suites they use are available on the internet, and we saw that these test suites is, are basically based on the scripts, and those scripts, what they do is call some modules of the operating system and then see if the operating system said operation successfully uh, uh, done or not. Uh, so, and then this approach is used also in certification. So um, if you want to certify that some testing, uh, that some kernel module um, uh, comply, com comply with some standard, then you have a set of test cases where you apply that test cases to, that, to your particular implementation. And if those test cases um, are passed, are 
satisfied, then you say, okay, I'm, com uh, I'm compliant with that particular standard. Um, however, it has two problems. Uh, this approach has two problems when uh, how it is applied now. The first one is documentation. Uh, for standards, there are a lot of documentation for the districts, so usually that's not a problem, but when we went to the storage community on the Open Solaris um, um, community page, um, we saw that there was no too much document documentation. If we don't know anything about uh, um, the kernels or storage uh, drivers and these things, it will be very, very difficult to understand what this thing is doing. So that's the first problem. And the second problem was flexibility. Uh, we're going to see that once you have your script, your test case as a script, then you run it once and twice, and everything is the same. Um, which means that the people that is writing those scripts is, has, have to think about all the possibilities that can happen. And that is almost impossible in any software development. You know, it, there is always somebody that will do <coughs> something that was not developed to that use so, and will break the system. So uh, you have to think about uh, a lot of possibilities that are not on the script. Um, and we saw that on the Open Solaris uh, testing, the, it's based on the scripts and it's based on a normal uh, uh, test suite where you have some test scenarios and you say inside the test scenarios you have some test purposes. So a test suite is divided in test scenarios and test purposes. And for each test purpose usually you have one script that uh, performs some operations and uh, do some assertions. Um, however, um, when you go and analyze um, the scripts that are for, uh, available for the storage community, um, most of these scripts are independent. What, what do I mean? Um, you can run one script from the beginning to the end, and it has a lot of, uh, it has a sequence of operations, but uh, the first operation is always preparing the, the environment, and the last operation is always cleaning the environment. So anything that happened in, in this sequence um, is forgotten for the next execution, which is good on some tests. I mean, if you want to control your test scenario, that's good. But what happens in, on a system testing? Um, sometimes you don't want to forget what happened before. That doesn't happen on a, on, a, on a system. When the user is doing something and crashes the system once and the, one, and the system the, the system does not clean itself uh, magically. Hopefully it does, but sometimes those errors come to, to the next section or, uh, or they, they are uh, persistent on the system and then those errors will uh, provoke some other crashes and, and still the, the, the system will uh, degrade itself as it is used. So um, we we didn't feel so comfortable with that thing of uh, okay, clean the system uh, after it's used, and the test purposes also are not fine grained. I'm, I'm going to show you, you uh, later that, but the idea is it has too many operations in a sequence uh, where you can, on our opinion, you can just uh, split it up in several operations and then do all the combinations, not only one sequence of combinations, but uh, more combinations to see what happens with the system. Um, maybe I started uh, on the wrong way. I talked about open Solaris, how it's tested, but I'm, I'm trying to apply model-based testing. What is model-based testing? Uh, Model-based testing is just the use of some kind of model, usually um, <coughs> some kind of formal model, to derive some test cases from it, and then apply that test cases against the system under test. Um, the most popular models you have are 
basic uh, automatons. Okay, you have states and um, you have actions that occur. Um, you have actions in the system that occur and then they provoke the system to change from one state to another. So you have actions and uh, states. Um, but that's the model. Then how does relate that with the system under test? Uh, when you have a test harness, which is usually a script uh, that understands what the model wants to do and then translates to the system and the test to really call to functions in the operating system uh, to execute them. Um, the good thing of model-based testing is that you can uh, perform an interactive approach where uh, you don't need to write the script and then say, okay, execute that, let's see if it passes or not. It's just execute this function and then and execute the next one, and what happens if I execute the next one? So you can work on a um, uh, on in an interactive fashion, interleaving the generation of the next action with the execution, and see what's happening in the uh, in the system uh, on the mean, uh, you know, in, in, in each part of this of the execution of your um, script or your test case. The problem with model-based testing is the cost of the testing because um, you should usually uh, you, you need still to write your scripts to go to the um, to, to communicate with the system under test, but you also need to model the system. And usually, modeling is not an easy task. Okay. Um, so that's the uh, usual architecture of uh, um, model-based system, or a uh, system that performs model-based testing. Um, you have the models that are fed into a, uh, into a tool, a testing tool. This tool understands the model on a model that we call the generator, and then um, And then produces an action that is going to be executed, and it sends it to the adapter. The adapter is the script that understands how this action actually is performed in the system under test, performs that, and then um, it can observe what happens in the system and go back to the tool and telling the tool, okay, that was the response of the system, and check with the model if it is okay or it is not. Okay. Um, so what we did to uh, apply this approach to Open Solaris for um, yeah, I should say Open Solaris. Is that, is that right? It's not Solaris. It's Open Solaris. Anyway, um, uh, what we did is uh, first we have to create an abstract model of the operating system, but only of the components we are testing, okay? We don't care about the rest of the system. We can isolate one module and say, okay, we are testing the file system, and the file system has some actions, particular action, action that will affect particular objects in the system, and that's what we uh, model. So we have, for example, a set of available disks, a set of uh, uh, partitions of each on, on each disk, um, some directories or mount, mount points to mount these file systems, etc. Uh, files um, and the actions that, that those are the objects and the actions that we can um, perform on this uh, file system model that are well, we can format the disk, we can create a partition, create a file system. Um, um, but we can also represent a sequence of action as an atomic action as the current scripts uh, do. So what we did is uh, try to compare two approaches. One is using model-based testing just to drive the execution of the current scripts. Okay. And, and, and analyze what happens. 
Um, so what we did is uh, we took the scripts on the, on the web and then um, we made this uh, model and the actions on the model actually corresponds one to one to each script in this test suite. Um, in this approach, the advantages of model-based testing that I said, we can um, test all the possibilities and see what happens if you know we change uh, some of the uh, we change the next action for another one uh, are lost because what the scripts do now is you know clean the system, run the script, clean the system again, so that no change is uh, carried to the next uh, execution of, of, a, of a test purpose or of a test suite. Um, however, uh, only the fact of building the models gives us the possibility, it's like a reviewing, uh, it's like a reviewing the code. Um, you are reviewing the code of the script and it gives it you the possibility to find some bugs. And actually, uh, we did find one of them. I, I'm going to talk about that later. Um, what we can do with this uh, linking model-based testing with the, with the script <coughs> is just mix the test purposes. Or what, it, what happens now is when you want to, you, you have a new release, for example, you get the whole test suite and say, Okay, run the test suite against the new, uh, uh, I think the current build, and then it should pass everything. Uh, what we can do with with this uh, with the model-based uh, testing approach is to just mix the test scenarios and say, okay, um, do not run them in sequence. Uh, you change the sequence and mix them in some way. Um, it was useful because. Although most of the scripts clean the system before and after um, the execution, some of them fail on that. So some of the scripts were not good enough cleaning the system, so some states remain uh, changed. So some changes remain to the next uh, execution. So um, the, the main problem, and we can, you can see, th this is the graph we uh, generate for the execution of um, our test cases. Um, the test cases are called uh, new FN, new file system one, new file system two, or FDIS one, FDIS two, because those are uh, for each one of these for formatting this for FDIS, for example, there are four test purposes on the suite. Uh, for the new file system, there are uh, um, if I don't remember, it's four. Uh, five, sorry. So you can uh, see how they how they can be combined, and some of the states uh, or, or better, the system change some states uh, between uh, one and, uh, and other execution. And in some cases, uh, for example, this is state six. Uh, most of this format. Uh, format and this new file system, they do not change the state, they just clean, clean, and, and, and that's all. Um, so, what, there was one thing that we saw that was a problem, because the test suite is already defined on a, on a test uh, framework, and this test, this test framework, what it does is traps the error. So, once there is an error, it is uh, reported and it is trapped and it is sent to a log. While we were using that script and our tool never reported an error and we said, okay, that's, well, the system is so good or there is some, some mistake there and there is some problem and we realized that the, the errors were trapped in the middle um, by using this script. So. Uh, we needed to, to do some realistic example. We needed to uh, get rid of this trapping and try to uh, make it more fine-grained to see what happened. And then what we need, uh, so, um, so what we did 
is um, we divided the script into very, very atomic operations. So um, one of the scripts were creating a, 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 a extended EFI um, uh, label on a system and then created some file system or UFS file system there. Um, everything together, so we separated that, we created we create the labels first, then we create the file system, then we mount it. So uh, we did that separation, and the idea was to um, do like something like that. Okay. Um, on the beginning, we have um, our new file system action. That's one script on the on the actor, on the current script. And that script, if you analyze that, has one operation that is called uh, format FDisk SMI, creating an SMI label on, on the disk. Then uh, it adds a partition that creates a uh, uh, UFS, and then it mounts it. So that's, that's the whole sequence. And we realized, look, we, we can do something better. We expect it to be better. And we can say, OK, FDisk is one operation, then add partition and delete partition, there are two operations there, and we can add the partition and delete the partition many times and see what happens, if, uh, get, and see if the, the, the disk or the system gets tired of doing it uh, some time. Um, we can create the, the file system and then uh, delete the partition and see what happens. It, it, it does, does it allow it or not? Of course it does and then mount the file system, and there is, a, there is an arrow that you cannot see there, but if we try to delete the partition when it is mounted, of course it will not do anything to the system. It's an error. It, it will not be allowed to do that, so the, the model stays there. So that was uh, our idea, and we did it for the uh, file system test purpose. So, um, including some format of these commands um, with the edges corresponding to actual commands in the operating system. And uh, in some cases, we didn't consider the, uh, the data generation, the parameter generation, because it was kind of, um, I was not used to Open Solaris and then um, the naming of the devices was uh, quite uh, uh, difficult to me, and the slices and partitions, and uh, so we try to simplify that. But um, there are some parts where we actually generate data, um, getting some information from the system to the tool. And uh, what we achieved, it's not a complete uh, uh, state. Uh, graph, but uh, you can see that there is a lot more of possible executions of actions, and of course there are a lot more of, a, a lot more uh, states on this execution. So uh, it's probable that most of them, or uh, some of them, will not be uh, so relevant or repetitive. Um, but if you try this approach on a, you know, during the night, or uh, if it is fully automated, you can let it run a couple of hours, and it will do, get crazy and do everything it can, uh, as uh, several users will do, and then try to break the system. And that's the idea of uh, testing. So um, I'm going to show you the tool working on uh, um, my open solaris virtual machine uh, the tool is a tool that is created by um, smart technology or KR Rose and Associates uh, we work with them um, Just let me start. It's a tool based in Prolog. Uh, we had some uh, 
last time trying to make it work in open source, uh, but we did it. And um, no, my scripts are basically a like Java server, uh, the, uh, the, a Java program that is listening into a socket and just um, apply it at a coding speed. Um, so, um, the server is initialized. Uh, you have, um, I will show you the model zip. Um, we have time. So, um, first I'm, I'm going to get the model where there are these scripts as they appear on the, um, um, as they appear on, on, on the web, on the uh, current test suite. And I'm going to connect this to the system. Um, I'm going on an interactive approach. Uh, whenever you start the system, you have to configure which disk do you want to use for testing. So I have this disk that this is the uh, C3, D1, D1. Um, and I'm going to configure it. Once you configure it and it is successful, you can see here um, the tool says, okay, it's, the test has passed. Then, um, then I can uh, run the other, the other actions that are here. So you, we, I can run the first strip of the disk or the second one. Um, uh, let's try that. Of course, um, the tool, as I said, will say it passes. Oh, I have to make the action. Um, it does some data generation, so I have to select which method and then which action I do want to run, I mean, which with data. If I can generate more more than one disk, for example, it's available, I can see that. Uh, you can see that um, the second test has passed and I can see the output of the other test suite that is running on the background, the one that traps there really also saying that the test passed. So, both of the tools are giving me the same, um, the same, um, the same result. Um, I'm going now to, and then on this tool you can do, uh, for example, a random generation, and you can try to run uh, it randomly and see what happens. Uh, I'm not going to do the random because there are some scripts that take like 15 minutes to run, so um, just, they just dump the disk to some uh, some tables of the disk to some files. Uh, so I'm going to um, close that and get another model. And this is the model that we need with um, more fine-grained operations. And in this case, Because the model, um, they, um, they share some of the variables, the prolog complaints. So uh, we use prolog because our models are declarative. We just say, OK, um, the idea of the models are you have um, some state variables, and over this state variable, you say, okay, in this action, for this action to occur, um, there are some conditions. These state variables have to have values in those ranges, and you put some conditions, and then you say, on the end, after this action has been executed, this action variable, uh, this state variable should have these other values, and then you just declare which values uh, you need in the model. Uh, let me just show you the Okay. 
Um, in this one, I uh, did what I showed you. Um, trying to, oh, I'm going to connect to the system and then um, my initialize probably is not, this one is not, uh, some of the actions on this model are not implemented. Uh, so some of them will just fail and some of them uh, will pass. For example, I, I'm going to, be, to do a, 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 a directory to mount the file system and that would fail probably because it already exists. Uh, I will try this one. Okay, so mount the one because I ran it before it exists. It cannot create it again, so it says I cannot create that mount point to be free for mounting a file system. I created another one, it passes. Um, and then I can just, for example, format the disk with an SMI uh, label. And let's see if it passes or... Yeah, it passes. And uh, I can try to format the slide zero. Um, uh, it passes again, um, probably, if I try to format the disk to a EF5, I don't remember, I think it was not, oh, that's good, everything is fine. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, actually, yeah, that's it. Um, I cannot, in my model, I'm, and I'm not sure if that is the actual representation of what happens in Open Solaris, but I cannot format the slide zero after I created an EFI uh, label on the disk. Probably because the label EFI uses P0 instead of S0. I'm not sure about the file system because it was very new to me. Uh, but that what I put in the model, and then it fails because uh, the system is, uh, is not uh, 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 the scripts are not running as the model predicts. Um, so uh, that's I just want to show you the. I have the 
if this SMI, SMI transition, it generates a parameter that is in which this guy want to, or which this I want to format, and then it's the same. It's get the variables, uh, assert some predicates on them, and then change the values, and then store the, value, the new values for that state variable. So it's pretty, uh, the, the models are very, very uh, straightforward. So um, that's one thing that is good. Um, we try to minimize the cost of creating the models by doing that. Um, and finally, we are <coughs> what we have, um, we have some suggestions and conclusions. As I said, it is, this is an ongoing project uh, where we are trying to um, expand this to more uh, to other modules and see if it really works with not only you know formal create, but it can <coughs> work probably in a more low-level uh, approach uh, inside the kernel or uh, still on the same approach but in, with another modules. Um, and then oh, that is the model base, the same principles apply at different levels of abstraction. Uh, of abstraction. So uh, we can do that. The only problem is with that we have some trade-offs. Uh, abstraction versus flexibility. The most abstract it is, uh, then it gets less flexible in what combinations we can do. But if we want it very flexible, we end writing another kernel instead of, or another module instead of a high abstract model. So we have to uh, uh, see uh, what is the right balance for that. And then uh, the abstraction versus the model complexity. The more abstract it is, it's very complex. If it is only one, you know, uh, only one function, um, it executes when these values are on the variables and the result is that. It's like 2 plus 2, it's equal to 4, and that's all. That's uh, easy. But if you want uh, less abstraction, more flexibility, then the complexity of your model it becomes harder or, or greater. Um, the model meeting leads to uh, bug discovery. We had a problem with the current scripts of, of, of that are on the storage community uh, test suite, there was one condition that was not right, and our tests were uh, failing when they shouldn't, shouldn't fail, and of course, the ones that should fail were passing, so and we, we, we let uh, uh, know this uh, to the people of, uh, of the community, um, and we can um, think of this model-based approach as having a standard for not only one operating system, but let's say, okay, uh, two, three, or several operating systems that um, want to implement the same functionality or the same standard, we can set a benchmark where the model <coughs> acts uh, as a generator for the test cases as well as uh, the documentation for the standard and we can uh, um, use it uh, as a benchmark for different operating systems. And uh, we don't have to think about new scenarios. Um, the model can think of them uh, instead of us or we can um, think, you know, in terms of the model and modify the model, and the model will discover new scenarios if uh, it is possible. Um, so that's yeah, that's it. Um, if you have any question or any comment, have you found any bugs in the kernel with the framework? Not in the kernel, or I'm not conf confident in saying the bug is in my model or is in the because that's the problem when you know, uh, well the other thing is to apply this uh, approach you need a modeler 
some, somebody that can you know, type the models or write the models, and you need an expert on the system that tells you, okay, that is how the system has to uh, behave. But we found that uh, on, 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 on the scripts, so, yeah. Do you think about using any other tools in uh, yeah, we can uh, use, I mean, the, the, the approach is the same, we can use different uh, tools, uh, that shouldn't be a problem, as long as we can write the models and express, we, we can use, uh, there are some set or beam models that they use in France, uh, as, as long as it has the expressive power to tell us values and uh, some, the results of some action. Yes. We've got time for one last question. Have you applied any signal level analysis to the models themselves? Or have you just done coverage um, unsealed? No, we haven't. Or we can because there are some coverage uh, reports on, on the tool. But we haven't worked on the on the basis of uh, coverage in the, in the models because um, the models are pretty basic and that kind of handcrafted. Uh, we we got coverage of all the scripts when we did that approach, but not on the one that was, was fine grained. We we didn't analyze that. Well, thank you very much, President. Thank you very much.